All right, looks like we're starting to build up the crowd. Well, I'm going to go ahead and open up. I'm Jim Kunkel. Uh, welcome to Estimating uh, Coatings. Uh, I'm sorry, Estimating Costs for Protective Coatings uh, Projects. We start off, I want to cover the disclaimer uh, for the live chat. Uh, Coatings Talk live chat makes every effort to provide accurate and up to date information uh, from the global protective coatings industry. Despite this care and attention, it is reasonably possible that the content and chat conversations within this live broadcast may have content that is incomplete and or inaccurate. The information and chat conversations on this live broadcast are offered without any form of guarantee or claim to accuracy. No liability is accepted for the consequences from such errors. No agreement shall be reached on the basis of such errors. Recording, distributing, and any use of this live chat is not permitted without the written permission of Jim Kunkel. That's me. Uh, for everyone to know, I am um, capturing the audio for future rebroadcast and also for archive recording. And um, before I set up the topic uh, for this evening, I'd like to cover how you can participate in the live chat. It's real easy. There is a raise your hand feature that you can icon that you can hit, raise your hand, and then I can bring you up onto the stage, open up your microphone, and you can participate, ask questions, and all kind of good things like that. Well, let's go ahead and we'll get everything started. Um, again, this uh, conversation tonight, this live chat, is estimating cost for protective coating, coatings projects. Now, um, what I'm going to do is provide information on approaches and best practices for estimating the initial and lifetime cost of protective coatings projects. Um, very important to understand that cost is a major factor in determining if protective coatings or another corrosion control alternative should be used for corrosion control. In some cases, the cost is also going to determine, too, if you're going to uh, use things collaboratively when it comes to protective coatings and or um, other types of control, uh, corrosion control methods. Now, if protective coatings are used, cost is a major consideration in the selection of a coating system to be used, but it's not the only major consideration. There's other factors that need to go into determining exactly what needs to be put into the project and then also to uh, what would be estimated uh, for it. So you're going to look at a lot of other factors as well. Now the cost of a coating system um, can be interpreted in several manners and uh, of major interest to is the cost of the applied or installed coating system and, and typically these are called turnkey costs. Now, owners must also be concerned with the operational and maintenance costs that occur over the life of a structure or an asset. The installation and maintenance costs are often collectively described um, under uh, life cycle cost or long-term cost. And now additional cost factors include the cost for inspection uh, and indirect costs such as a loss of product, downtime, and inconvenience to the community. So when you think of large capital projects or you're thinking even of maintenance projects, um, you, what you really need to look at is if you're a ref major refinery or you're in a production, what's the cost of having a major impact, loss of production, downtime due to a corrosion related failure or a coating system failure those are things that are very important to look at because some of the impacts could be not only on the profit, you know, revenue generation and profit side, but also when it comes to environmental impact, um, also public relations as well. So if you have a major uh, failure that causes something catastrophic to happen or, again, downtime or a release or something like that into the environment, those can be major impacts uh, to the company to the asset owner, and uh, those are things to consider as well. So the cost of a uh, of an applied coating system is often uh, an even insignificant. I'm sorry, insignificant portion of the overall cost of a facility or structure, but it's important consideration before selection. Uh, coating costs can range from anywhere from about one percent too high as 10% uh, of the overall cost of a project. So when we think of coating systems, we're really not looking at a huge portion of the cost of it being tied to the actual uh, project cost. Now, acquiring um, accurate and reliable cost data is a major challenge for the protective coatings industry. And so 
some of the things that we'll cover tonight, um, these are things that also, too, if you participate in uh, with AMP and also other uh, trade organizations or even other types of uh, 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 organizations, um, they cover a lot of the other type of uh, uh challenges and also talk about a lot of things regarding impacts as well. So let's go ahead and we'll talk about the types of costs. The first thing I wanted to cover is initial versus lifetime cost. When discussing cost, it's useful to distinguish between the initial cost of a coding project and the cost incurred in protecting uh, that structure over its lifetime. Now the initial cost is the most visible cost since it's the money spent in the short term at the beginning of the project. Uh, the financial impact is both immediate and quantifiable. Now lifetime costs include the initial cost and all other potential costs involved in the upkeep and the maintenance of the coded, the, the coded structure uh, or asset. And, and long term lifetime maintenance of the coded structure um, cost has the greater impact on the financial viability of the company or its project. Uh, Short-term budget considerations, however, often in influential in making choices of coding types, working method, contract style, and other alternatives, often ensuring that manage, uh, managers focus on the initial cost. Now, the next uh, costs I want to talk about are going to be indirect versus, I'm sorry, indirect versus direct cost. Initial cost can be classified as direct cost or indirect cost. Uh, direct cost are those which are readily att attributed to the coding activity. Um, for example, the cost of a coding, a coding contract or an engineering service. Uh, direct cost are re relatively easy to measure. Uh, indirect cost are those which arise because of the need for coding work, but are not readily identifiable or measurable. Uh, indirect costs are often unpredictable and therefore extremely difficult to estimate and often not considered um, really uh, in cost analysis. Over the lifetime of a structure, um, let's say it would be 20 or 30 years or longer, there are likely to be many costs associated with corrosion protection, including uh, both direct and indirect cost. Now, for methods for estimating initial cost, um, you have unit cost. And the most common and straightforward means of estimating cost is by using the unit cost. Um, the work is broken into measurable units. Uh, for example, an area of surface to be prepared and coded. Uh, in some cases, the estimate is based on the number of hours and labor required. Uh, and depending on the complexity of the jo uh, job, uh, various additional cost items uh, will be added to the base cost. Uh, these include cost for special equipment and cost for subcontracted items. Um, so uh, when we look at the activities, you know, one of the simplest approaches is to estimate the cost per unit of a surface area. So breaking it down by, you know, a square foot or a square meter. Um, you know, these estimates may be based on historical records or similar projects that might be attained by breaking the unit cost into specific sub-elements. Um, it's assumed that the amount of labor and material is roughly proportional to the amount of surface to be coded. Uh, if anybody would want to uh, just join me on the stage, you can just feel free to uh, raise your hand and I will gladly keep glancing over to see if anybody does want to come up. Uh, and I'll open up your mic on the stage. Now, um, this assumption is certainly valid for coating materials and thinners. Um, for labor, the cost per square meter or square foot may vary, but the methods allows one to modify labor rates based on different conditions. Um, the cost of a coating system can be broken into the following components. There is going to be surface preparation, um, the application of the coating uh, system, the coating materials, uh, the numbers of uh, coats that are required, and the required uh, curing conditions. Um, numerous uh, analysis have been done to show, you know, which portion proportion of the portion of the total cost is attributed to each of these items. Uh, these data, uh, this data is general, as each job is very unique and important to be aware that of the assumptions made in deriving these numbers, 
you know, modifications are often made based on the following factors. Uh, the first being the height of the surfaces to be uh, coated, um, the con general condition of the structure, you know, uh, steel structure, is it pitted, is it rusting, has it been previously painted, um, the type and shape of a structure, you know, when it comes to accessibility, um, other type of requirements where you might need scaffolding, containment, all different things related to the project like that. On the location, is it going to be work done in the f in the work? Oh, here we go. And allow to speak. Hey, how's it going? You have to unmute yourself there. But I got you up on the okay. stage. Hey, how you doing, man? Hey, James. Real good. Uh, question. Um, how do you feel about uh, who, who as it pertains to cost when it comes to inspections, who who do you think that mostly falls on when it comes to uh, the estimating side? Because I feel like, you know, in my experience, a lot of times once the project has started, you know, everyone says, well, we didn't, you know, allocate any money for a QC. So then, you know, nobody wants to pay for it. So sometimes it gets ignored or, or not really done to the, I guess, recommended. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I know what you mean. In a perfect world, we want to, you know, obviously in a perfect world, you always want to have that uh, in the project uh, requirements, you know, when it comes to the specification, you know, where it calls out. For example, you know, my time with the SSPC, uh, when I work with the QP program for the contractors, you know, they had to have uh, people who were uh, trained, uh, certified or, you know, trained when they were doing the quality control and things like that. Uh, on the project and then a lot of times the owners would have a, a QA either a third party or an internal to be able to do um, kind of oversight just you know kind of keeping an eye on things uh, but relying on that quality control of the con on the on the contractor side so to your point uh, there are a lot of projects unfortunately um, that you know the inspection aspect of it uh, when it comes to a quality assurance is sometimes it's not really um, looked at and they're you know, you're kind of scrambling to say, um, finding money or, uh, you know, kind of opening things up to be able to afford that. Is that, is that kind of where you're, you're looking to talk about? Yeah. And then also balancing out, you know, the, the cost of the project, you know, even if the client's not paying for it, even if I'm the contract, you know, uh, what, what benefit would I get a, versus bringing a QC now versus bringing a QC later, you know, when you have your failures and we got to do rework, the kind of aid in that kind of process to prevent that additional cost. Yeah, and then, you know, typically too, you know, if I'm uh, I'm an owner and um, you know, obviously production's going to be done and as I'm, I'm a contractor, you know, if I if uh, the owner does require kind of that QA, you know, this is where the contractor is going to go through um, quality control is on the uh, contractor, the QA person for the owner is basically just you know, observing and verifying everything because that contractor is going to want to submit the pro the work they've completed to date to be able to invoice and be paid upon as well. But the other thing too, when it comes to corrective actions, it's better. And I think with your experience, you agree to this is it's better to have that go as the process is unfolding in the project to do that quality control so that you can catch. And then if there's any corrective actions that need, need to be done reinforcement so that the contractor can fix the some um, uh, non-conforming work, but then also too, that's an opportunity for them to uh, fix whatever the situation might be, so they're not repeating the same uh, uh, non-conformity moving forward. Yeah, proactive instead of reactive. You got it. That's yeah, my, that's, yeah. I understand. That's that's just wanted to talk about that with everybody. That was it. Yeah, no worries. All right, James. All right, we'll go ahead and keep going through. That was a great question. I appreciate that. I like that. I like that interaction. Um, so we were talking about with the location. Is it going to be? Is the work going to be done in the? Up uh, oh, here we go, Lee. All right, Lee, you just have to unmute yourself. There you go, Lee. I'm so. I'm sorry. I hit the button by accident. I apologize to everyone. I, I was just listening, but but I, I was just kind of going to reiterate. Yeah, you know the the QA QC part of it when we're on site is kind of part of the process, and it's usually built into the pricing. 
for for when we're we're out on site or what I've seen in the past. This way, you can be as you said, proactive. So, so that I just yeah. wanted to kind of re- reiterate that. I, I, I hit the button by accident. I apologize. No, that's okay. A lot of times that people want to react, and that happens. So, appreciate you listening. Be safe uh, if you're driving. Okay. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Oh, right. And, uh, you know, like I said, the location of the work, is it being done in a shop or is it field work? Now, geographic location has a lot because you have environmental zones, you have different conditions. I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, so, you know, we've got seasons that, you know, are going to be a little tougher to do some work. The further north you go, and you get closer to uh, the those Arctic zones and things like that. You've got a limited time, so you know a lot of factors are going to go into exactly um, how the project's going to unfold, what the costs are going to be, you know what conditions are going to be, dehumidification. You have to put heaters in, all those type of things like that when it comes to the location, the weather, uh, and then any additional modifications that need to be made for hazardous. Uh, paint removal, you know, lead, taking lead off, you know, once there's lead on it, always treat it as there's lead on it forever. Um, and then also other special considerations. Uh, maybe you're in a certain area where um, when you're blasting and you're using abrasives, you have to have the ability for dust control, or maybe there has to be adjustments on some projects where uh, multiple phases require different types of uh, surface preparation and other types of considerations to be brought to bear. Now, when it comes to labor and material method, um, now this approach is is based on deriving estimates um, for really the following uh, components. Uh, The surface area to be painted, um, the number, when it comes to the number of work hours required to perform each stage of the work, um, labor cost, including um, anything related to uh, benefits and other types of uh, cost insurances and things like that that might be required, uh, material cost, uh, equipment uh, equipment cost, overhead cost. Um, the other thing too to look at when we're looking at with um, you know labor and materials method, um, some of the things associated with it's going to be you know conditions that might happen where you're not able to. Um, start the project at a certain time, um, maybe some situations are right. So I know those are tough to bake in, but, you know, those are some things, you know, based on historics in an area that maybe you can look to con- consider as well. Now, when we talk about um, the surface area to be painted, um, you know, you could be talking anything about it. You know, it could be a tank bottom. It could be the walls. It could be piping. You know, that that's measured or estimated in the cost of painting per unit area. Um, is then applied to achieve the total painting cost. So you're going to have the all the conversions you're going to need to do for square uh, square footage and things like that. But taking into consideration that if you're looking at piping or if you're looking at doing tank bottoms and walls or if you're looking at if you're painting on bridge structures where you have a steel bridge and you have certain um, um, you're going to have you know anything from plates to whatever you might have. You know Pittsburgh we've got a lot of legacy historic bridges and so you know those those are a lot of areas to calculate you know what now obviously you're going to come up with an estimate a lot of it can rely on your past work and experience to figure out but there's those calculators that are out there uh, available um, for people when I mean by calculators those estimating books and guides and things like that now um, estimate for required worker hours you know after the surface area when it comes to square footage or square meters has been calculated the time required for surface preparation and or, or paint application must also be uh, calculated for each item of work and then the total area of each item is divided by the number of square feet or square meters uh, that can be completed per worker hour and that's going to be your production rate and that will yield the total worker hours required to complete the work so production rates and uh, worker hour estimates can also be obtained from estimating guides. And most uh, painting contractors and experienced estimators, however, um, know from past experience, as I mentioned earlier, that the average production rate can be used uh, for a given work item. Uh, the estimator must decide on the number and size of crews um, that can be mobilized. All right, let me get you back up on stage, man. There you go. Just unmute yourself. Hey, James. Uh, I do a little bit 
estimating here and there. Um, but I heard you say something about material that may be available. Is there anything that you recommend? I'm not sure if you're legally able to say or not, but uh, it'd be nice to know, you know, some things that you may recommend, some tools that may help. Uh that would maybe aid in the process to maybe clarify some questions or help uh, oh, with estimating. Oh, you're talking about like um, some of the resources that are out there to help people related to estimating and things like that? Yes, sir. You know, the one thing that comes to mind that really helped me, and it was part of getting your, um, if you go for the, uh, well, it would be the legacy, but AMP did continue it, which is the Protective Coding Specialist um, Certification, the PCS. The, um, if you've ever taken the SSPCC uh, C2, which deals with um, basically uh, the bulk of it is on estimating projects, uh, you know, estimating protective coding of projects, um, and a, a lot of my information actually comes from that course. It's an on it's an online course, uh, but it is a core component of getting your PCS. Um, I always found value with that, and then there's also uh, a couple books. Uh, that legacy SSPC had. I'd have to check the AMP library if they if they still sell those at the bookstore. But they had an estimating guide as well. And then um, I always relied on the um, uh, I think it was called Simple Math for for coding professionals or something like that. Um, yeah, I've heard and, of that uh, one. Yeah. <laughs> so, but you know, like I, a lot of it comes down to, and you know, you've you've done some estimating, and I know there's some people on this on this uh, a live chat right now that have done estimating. Um, a lot of it really comes down to sheer experience, and you know, I when I first started in the the coatings industry, it was in the powder coat. Uh, area. I worked for a uh, steel service center here in Pittsburgh. They had a, a fabrication unit we bought in 2008, and uh, it came with a, uh, luckily, with a 750 foot powder coat line. And, um, you know, I remember coding or uh, estimating some projects and things like that where, um, you know, luckily, where you bake in a little factor, but there was a couple where I didn't make the right par profit margin um, based on the work and everything else because I, I calculated wrong when it came to, you know, exactly what was the uh, the square footage total of the project. Uh, and that, you know, that can be a major, <laughs> a major problem if you really don't have the tools or in some cases too, um, when it comes to having someone who could verify your estimate to make sure that you've done uh, the right job. Uh, so uh, that's, you know, that's some things I always point out there um, with my experience. It was trial by error, but then once you get into a rhythm, you, you kind of uh, have a good understanding of what needs to be brought to bear in most cases. Now, my, ex my experience was easy because I'm, I'm fabricating and I'm painting in a shop. We weren't doing any field work. And obviously in the field, that's a whole new exactly. can of worms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much pretty much the same concept. I heard you mention something about, you know, companies having historical data that they try and base their uh, work factors on. And I think I'm a strong believer in, you know, verifying those work factors because just because it worked for you on the last job does not mean it's definitely going to work for you on this job. It may be high probability, you know, based on your research, but it's still important to at least, like you say, consult with the people out in the field or consult with somebody who has the experience, who's done it, who who's maybe been to that project or dealt with that, you know, specific situation or, you know, that way, you know, you have the most accurate estimate possible. Yeah. And then the other thing, you know, you know, related to the job I have with international, you know, working on the aspect of uh, sp engineering side, the specification, if you're working with your, your coding uh, suppliers and they're providing you a, a, a solid specification based on, again, a lot of factors on the asset, the environmental zone, you know, what's the general condition, you know, in other words, for example, the tank, you know, what's the cargo in it? Is it is it heated? What's its max temperature? What's its min? You know, all those things that go into that exactly. and, you know, having that information, that really does help a lot because, you know, there's a lot of things that can be brought to bear when it comes to materials. It's just, again, using the best practice, I'm sorry, leaning on um, the material suppliers to kind of help in that process can really kind of um, really help um, minimize a, a lot of the issues and challenges when it comes to estimating both uh, when you're planning a project or if you're a contractor and then you're putting a bid in and you're putting your estimate in on, on the work as well. Understood, brother. I appreciate it. Thanks, man. Here we go. 
Now, when it comes to labor costs, you know, wage rates um, can be different. You can have uh, union shops, um, you can have union contractors, and then you can also have um, non-union shops and non-union contractors. So, but typically you have a prevailing wage rate that, you know, is, um, you know, the prevailing wage rates are there and you can get that information from trade uh, publications and government sources. Um, estimating guides uh, can be useful references as well when it has that information in it or how to work in around that. Um, the wage, wage rate should include all uh, labor payments, including hourly uh, wage, any fringe benefits, insurance, uh, and this is often referred to as a, a charge out rate. Uh, now, when it comes to material cost, the numbers of, you know, gallons or liters of uh, paint and, you know, anything for cleanup, you know, anything related to materials, you know, has to be estimated based on the areas being coated and the dry fill thickness and mills uh, of a coating uh, that's going to be applied. There's also going to be loss factors that need to be estimated and material loss factors such as overspray, um, range, you know, generally from 10 to sometimes 50% of the total paint purchase, depending on, again, it comes down to the general weather conditions, the job location, and the type of uh, asset structure that's going to be coded. You know, the practical spreading rates are normally more useful than theor theoretical spreading rate figures quoted in the coding manufacturer's product data sheets. Um, the estimate should also include the cost of consumable supplies when it comes to abrasives, uh, cleaning rags, um, respirators and respirator cartridges, overalls and other protective clothing, masking tape, small tools, scrapers, wire brushes, hand tools, you know, all the consider consideration uh, of consumable items that are going to be expended during the course of the work. Now, when it comes to equipment cost, you know, the cost of equipment used in a job must also be estimated such as uh, such costs might include uh, charges for the use of compressors, dust collectors, vacuum or recycling equipment, um, any type of containment that needs to be done. You got spray guns, you know, airless or conventional spray pots or guns. Um, if you're going into something like a plural component or some other type of special equipment, um, air and paint hoses, fuel cost um, for diesel compressors, obviously fuel cost right now. Um, you know, when we were looking at the prices going up, that was a, a major thing that would impact um some projects, because you've had fuel costs that could literally double or, or go even higher in some cases, um, and electrical generators should also be um, estimated. You know, most painting contractors have standard cost for these items, and they charge clients on either a daily or a weekly or a monthly basis, depending on the project. And then there's going to be overhead costs, you know, indirect costs of overhead um, when it comes to insurance, license, taxes, any other type of overhead cost that um, might be uh, an indirect cost that might be um, added to the um, total cost of the project. Um, now let's talk about um, methods for estimating a lifetime cost. And the first thing that I want to cover is the life cycle cost concept. Um, life cycle cost are those costs incurred protecting steel from the from corrosion over the life of a structure now this includes the initial cost of applying the protective coating system um, the various inspections assessments touch-ups and maintenance uh, painting activities so when you think of a coating system over a lifetime what you're going to look to do is you're going to be doing assessments you'll have routine inspections done to uh, check for corrosion condition um, the condition of the existing coating system and then in some cases you might have maintenance work that needs to be done uh, that can be done um, you might even have a condition where you're able to do a, an overcoating or something like that to extend out the uh, the life of the uh, coating system so you know when you're looking at that it's important to recognize that you know in many instances in, um, many situations a a strategy that might result in a lower initial cost could cost more in the long run because of higher maintenance and even replacement costs. So when you're looking at uh, as, a, as an owner, you really need to look at the life cycle of the structure, what you're looking to get out of it. The other thing when it comes to those other considerations, you know, downtime, production loss, 
uh, bad PR or anything that might happen regarding a f to a corrosion issue or a failure. So it's 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 better to make that investment up front than to go go cheap. Doug, hold on one second. I'll bring you up here. All right, Doug, just unmute yourself and you can join in. Yeah, Jim, uh, I, I'm glad you brought up this point because I was just reading in Material Performance that mm -hmm. uh, I read that too. Li lining uh, water tanks that a uh, a high high solvent coating or low solids coating might have a user life cycle cost of 18 and a half years, while high solids or 100% solids coating might have a, a usable life expectancy of like 26 years. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I, I really that, you know, because, you know, I encounter that pretty much on a, on a daily basis with some of the, you know, the projects we work around. But it really comes down to is going to be, you know, what is the owner looking when it comes to, you know, what are they willing to bring, bring, bring the bear? And then what are the alternatives? But part of it is also trying to lay out the argument of, yeah, we, you could go low cost at the beginning, but you're not going to get what you're looking for or potentially could get by going with this this particular type of system. And so, you know, I think a lot of that comes to the industry, us as industry professionals, to educate because, you know, earlier I talked about how, you know, really look at the coding costs. There's really, it's a small part of that project, but ultimately understanding exactly, you know, what they're looking to get out of it and then matching it up to what technology can be brought to bear when it comes to a coding system and trying to really kind of, um, win over let's say that mindset of of the better the investment up front the potential reward in the long on the long run what do you think doug i i would tend to agree with you i i, I was told by a wise contractor years ago um, um cheap is expensive and expensive is cheap yeah yeah and it, it's 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 kind of a, a little bit of head trash um you know I, again i i go back as the global protective coatings industry, you know, I was actually thinking of one time of doing a, a live chat, you know, is, is the protective coatings industry relevant? And when I say that is, you know, when I, you do a lot of searches on coatings and protective coatings, really not high rates when it comes to search terms and all that. And, you know, okay. you and I, and all of us on this call, we deal with this on a daily basis. So there's so much misconception. And a lot of times it's like, well, just throw paint on it. Why, why don't I want to spend that kind of money? I'd rather go this, but they don't understand by, you know, you're going to shave a little bit off, but you're not going to get the value you could get out of going with that system that really needs to be put on that structure or systems that need to be put on that structure. You know what I mean? Sure. I, I think pro probably part of the problem is guys or gals are thinking, I, I just need to last until I retire in 10 years. Uh, that happens. Uh, not to give names, but one of my first learning experiences is uh, going into a, uh, a particular uh, um, uh, energy location, uh, energy provider, let's say that, and then um, uh, – working with the engineering team and they put stuff in the specification just like we talked about uh and then there was a failure on a project and i get a phone this has something to do with my current current position sure but get a phone call and says yeah there was a failure and uh turns out what ended up happening was my biggest mistake was not only should i talk be talking to engineering in that situation, but I should have been talking to at least a director of procurement because a commodity buyer got it and went a different route to oh, save geez. some money. And then we set up another meeting. We had another meeting, and the conversation went around about the uh, the project, and the commodity person said, I'm retiring in five years, and I get incentivized for saving the mo company money. And uh, it was interesting to see the the – the view on the, the facial expression on the director of procurement you know, who was saying our job is to do what's in the best interest of the company, not what type of incentive we get or I'm retiring in five years. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that happens probably too often. It does. Um, I have another story, but I don't, I don't want to share it with, cause it'll, it'll give away who it is, but you know, another, again, where you have someone, um, just makes a decision, uh, the blue of I'm going to go cheap. And, um, uh, like you said, uh, cheap cost in the long term. you know, just sure. Well, I'll let other people chime in. I just wanted to say hello. Yeah. Good to have you. I appreciate having you for sure. Thanks. 
Yeah, if anybody else wants to come up on the stage, just raise your hand and uh, I'll open up your mic and we'll be good to go. So just a couple more things I wanted to cover when we were talking a little bit about the um, uh, cost and things like that. Um, you know, we covered a little bit about the life cycle and to, you know, when you look at the total cost of future maintenance or repair, you know, it, it can be estimated, but with difficulty, it, it can be very difficult because there's so many variables. And, and really, when we look at the unpredictability of it, this is where I think a lot of times the historical data, but really what I think is the important aspect of it is when you have, if you're an owner and you have assets, you have a tank farm, if you do have a plan in place where you're routinely assessing, inspecting, doing maintenance repair, maybe you have some opportunity to do some other type of overcoat or something that might be done. If you're monitoring everything perfectly, if you have a good balance, maybe it's going to be a balance between protective coating systems and cathodic protection. You should have a good life cycle, but at least you're going to have a better handle on the general condition so that things don't get critical to a point where now all of a sudden you have a major problem and now you're dealing with the major impact of additional cost um, because you just let something go a little bit beyond control. And I think that's really what, um, you know, a lot of people really need to look um, look at as well. But, you know, there are sometimes, you know, when you're looking at, you know, lifetime cost of the coating systems, you know, and other corrosion control options, you know, they can be calculated using methods of, um, you know, looking at different types of approaches to it. And I think that's where you're going to lean on the professionals out there. Um, uh, the um, cathodic people, or the coating um, manufacturers and things like that. Well, I think I've gone a lot over this. And so I probably could keep going even more. But before we would uh, wrap this up this evening, because we've pushed past a half hour now, um, does anybody have any questions or comments or would you like to add something related to this, um, you know, estimating costs for protective coatings projects? Just uh, feel free to raise your hand, come up on stage and appreciate uh, appreciate your input anybody out there all right there we go bring you up on stage and Stephen just unmute yourself and you can speak away hey James first of all thanks for hosting us that that was a really really interesting way to go about it um, listening to the guys I mean there's some really key things here and I, I think you know not only building your estimate, but also as you're building your brand, um, you know, a lot of things that the magic word in sales is no, right? Yeah. So, so the, the key here, what I'm hearing is like QAQC. I, I think the reason that's important is really to differentiate yourself from the com competitors. If, if you really do what the product data says, do the expectations, it makes it really easy to build your brand. Um, a lot of comments are saying, well, this is what's in a budget. You know, again, it gets that magic word, no. I mean, each, each one of these points you bring, it really is a, a way to bring a value-added sale together. And, you know, you don't want to be the cheapest guy there because he certainly left something out. But uh, I really do appreciate putting this together. It's uh, very informative. I thought some very good questions were asked. So thanks again. No, I appreciate that. You know, and one, the one thing that I always say to people, too, is that, you know, as, as an owner, really what you're looking for is to – uh, take the the lowest qualified bid and so you know there can be a huge swing and and you've probably seen competitors on your side where you're you're making a bid and you're like there's no way that ABC company could do that project for that type of money and you know unfortunately I think there's just a lot of uh, a lack of education and information out there and you have people who jump on something like that uh, and then ultimately have a, a major problem um, but you know again I, and that gives a bad eye to it doesn't matter if you do floor coatings or you do you know tank linings or you know bridge painting or anything you might do um, our industry kind of suffers because of uh, some of the things that go on it's, uh, you know, I, I can tell you for the last, and no exaggeration, for the last three months, all I've been doing is fixing competitors' uh, projects. And it all gets down to lack of QAQC, lack of details, wrong specifications. And, uh, you know, you, you guys got to remember, you own this. You know, if you, the owner, if you made a mistake, the owner's going to love to let you go forward. But, you know, it's, it's, it's on your ticket. So, 
uh, you know, I always suggest before you put numbers together, get a test patch in, get your mill thickness down, get your sign offs. Um, you know, the tighter you have it, the better off you're going to be. Yeah, very good. Appreciate it. Thank you, Stephen. All right, guys. Take care. Thank you, sir. Take care. Have a great night. Okay, you too. Okay, before we uh, close this session up, anybody else want to uh, come up on stage? All right. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, next Wednesday, I'm going to actually have two guests on, and we're going to be talking about um, technology uh, such as robotics, uh, drones for inspection. Um, I'm also going to be talking about some technologies related to um, inspection when it comes to, uh, you know, as an inspector, what you can use to record your data, your information, uh, and also transmit that um, instead of doing the the old style of writing up your daily inspection logs and reports and corrective actions. A lot of this can be done electronically, so I'll be talking about that. So I'll post the event on Monday, and um, like I said, we'll have a couple guests uh, talk about the robotic side, and I'll cover the uh, technology on the inspection side. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Have a good rest of your day or evening um, or morning, depending on where you're at. Thank you so much.